on this Sunday night. The National is on the ground in Haiti. People prepare for more protests while friends and family in Canada worry. Everybody's locked, everybody's stranded. Tonight, a firm new warning from the country's president. I trusted what I was hearing on the radio. They're out thousands of dollars and going public after taking financial advice from fake experts. I never once uh, believed that it was an ad. The blurred lines between information and advertising. And how a parent's choice is contributing to an outbreak that could have been prevented. At that time, we were a lot of parents worrying about the, the MMR vaccine. The family at the center of BC's measles outbreak speaks to CBC News. This is The National. After days of street violence, the political chaos in Haiti seems to be on pause, at least for the moment. But with more anti-government protests expected this week, many Haitians are now scrambling to cover the basics. And that means collecting much-needed food, water and medicine, if they can find it. Also, in desperately short supply, gasoline, now the lifeblood of daily economic survival. To fully comprehend the situation in this troubled country, you've got to be there, on the ground. And our Paul Hunter is in Haiti tonight. He paints a grim portrait of anger and desperation in Port-au-Prince. If Haitians had a break this weekend from the rioting and street violence that had rocked this country for days, it hardly seemed it. Yes, there were people on the streets of Port-au-Prince, those who'd locked themselves in their homes for more than a week trying to stay safe, but a litany of burnt-out gas stations underline the fury now rampant in this country, not to mention outside the presidential palace, where rocks thrown in anger last week now litter the street. But. Reminders, too, of what led to those riots in the first place. A lack of almost everything. At this freshly reopened gas station, desperation over what little gasoline is left in the pumps. These men would normally be working at the flower shop behind them, but with no deliveries for days, there is no work. Adding to their misery, a president who, in their view, is doing nothing about any of what ails Haiti. I live 100 meters from the president's house, he says. I have no electricity, no water. We have a shortage of everything, said this man. Today, the barely functioning health care system led to this incredible scene in a hospital parking lot. Yes, she's having a baby. And the list goes on. All those propane tanks, people here had been lining up since 6 a.m., betting that a supply truck might come here eventually. When it did, cheering. But as one man told us, fact is nothing ever really changes in Haiti, adding that in his view, outside Haiti, no one even cares. Sky-high inflation, few jobs, little food, and fading hope in a country where poverty remains beyond the pale. My feeling, he says, is that it is the beginning of the end of the world in Haiti. Indeed, at that propane station, alongside the truck with the fresh and sought-after tank of fuel, a half dozen police officers, hefty automatic weapons at the ready, standing by, keeping the peace for now. Paul Hunter joins me now. That uneasy peace you talked about, Paul, can that even last past tomorrow? Well, the government sure hopes so. It put out a news release tonight calling for a return to normal in this country uh, henceforth. We'll see what happens. Uh, this much is clear. Haitians are angry. It's as if this country has reached a tipping point. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the realization that nothing ever changes in this place. You know, we talked a lot about Haiti nine years ago after the earthquake. You know, nine years later, it's as if they cleared away the rubble, but that's it. Right. And now the suggestion that many hundreds of millions of dollars that was supposed to go into making this a better place flat out didn't, that instead it fell to government corruption, leaving, you know, regular Haitians with the same old, same old, no food, no medicine, no water, no electricity, you name it. Haitians are enraged at a government that seems incapable 
of making this a better place. Paul Hunter in Port-au-Prince tonight. Thanks, Paul. Every month, Haitians in the Toronto area meet for a special Creole church service. Today, they did more than pray. As the CBC's, CBC's Talia Ricci tells us, they also made plans to help the people that they are so worried about. I'm going to try another one. Lost connections have been common these days. Has it been hard to get a hold of them? It's not possible. For many, the feeling of unease lingers with every dropped call. When I don't hear from them, I have that sense what's happening. This special mass in Creole brings the Haitian community together in Toronto. For some, what's unfolding in Haiti doesn't feel far from home. I feel like if I'm in the middle of it, but from afar, but I don't feel it's outside of my life. Antoine DeRose says he left the country just days before the violence began. I feel lucky that I'm back here with my family in Canada. At the same time, I'm feeling very sad of the situation that those are, who are left behind have to go through. Many stayed after today's service to discuss ways they can help and to share their worries about family far away. People are not allowed to go about their personal lives. They had to stock up on food. The group plans to find out what supplies are most needed in Haiti, then raise the money to send them. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Now about 150 Canadians stranded in Haiti have begun returning home. During the worst of the protests, it was too dangerous to even travel to the airport. A group of about a dozen missionaries returned home to Alberta tonight. Haitians are not bad people for the most part. They're just normal people that want to provide for their families and, and um, live a peaceful life. Canadians from across the country have been taking the advice of the government and getting out of Haiti while commercial flights are available. You're home safe. The largest group, 113 tourists from Quebec, touched down last night in Montreal. Back in Haiti, their tour operator, Air Transat, had to hire helicopters to airlift them from their resort to the airport in Port-au-Prince. <laughs> also last night, Dr. Emilio Bazil arrived in Ottawa, greeted by family who had feared for his safety. Dr. Bazil had been on a medical mission along with four other Canadian caregivers. On Friday, they risked their lives by driving to the airport, encountering roadblocks and demands for money. I feel alive, feel happy, and I didn't expect, at some point, I didn't expect that. But he doesn't blame the people of Haiti. Those are people who have been in misery. They don't have electricity. They don't have a drinking water. They don't have what we have here. And I even didn't blame them, although I almost got killed. It was a stressful, a stressful very stressful uh, situation. And now that he's back, we're all, it's a relief. Global Affairs Canada says a few other groups of aid workers and missionaries have plans to leave tomorrow. Health officials in B.C. are battling an outbreak of measles, nine confirmed cases this month alone. The virus is extremely contagious and can lead to serious complications and even death. But it's also entirely preventable with immunization. Now, the Vancouver family at the centre of the recent outbreak is speaking out to CBC News. As Renee Filipponi reports, the father says it wasn't their fault. The rash really amplified like it was all over. Emmanuel Bilodeau's youngest son contracted measles during a family trip to Vietnam last month. It spread to his two other children. None had been given the measles vaccine as infants. Back then, you got to think like 10, 12 years ago, there was a lot of uh, debate on the MMR vaccine, uh, lots of uh, drama around it. So we were a little bit concerned uh, and we were worried. His children have since been vaccinated against other diseases, including before their trip to Asia, but not for measles. Bilodeau says the doctor didn't recommend it. That day he would have told me, you need MMR, like you got, like your kids, like it's, I would have been like, yeah, for sure, let's get MMR going here. He also blames BC Children's Hospital for not diagnosing measles soon enough. They made multiple trips to the hospital over the course of weeks. Measles is highly infectious and spreads through the air. Close contact is not needed for transmission. 
The health authority is trying to track down anyone who may have been in contact with the Bilodeaux or the others who have contracted measles. It is, I think, the responsibility of people to ensure that their children are vaccinated. Vaccine hesitancy is an increasing problem. Public health officials want to make sure the message is clear. Vaccines are safe. All of those, you know, former uh, claims that it's associated with autism have been disproven. And Rosie, today the Prime Minister tweeted out that vaccines prevent outbreaks like this and save lives, but immunizations aren't mandatory in Canada. Students in Manitoba, Ontario and New Brunswick have to show proof they've been vaccinated when they enroll for school, but they can be exempt for health or religious reasons or simply because they don't want to vaccinate their children. Okay, tough lesson for people to learn tonight. Thanks, Renee. Appreciate it. Yeah, Renee Filippone in Vancouver. Was it a hate crime or a hoax? Police say they want to interview American actor Jussie Smollett again about an attack he says happened in Chicago last month at the hands of Trump supporters. The incident has been held up as an ugly example of the widening divisions in America, but now there are suggestions it might have been staged. Ellen Morrow has the story. I will never be the man that this did not happen to. Mm. I am forever changed. Ever since Jesse Smollett said he was the victim of a violent attack, the story has grabbed international attention. Kamala Harris, a 2020 contender, called it an attempted modern-day lynching. Smollett told police he was beaten and had a rope thrown around his neck by men who shouted a Make America Great Again slogan, along with racist and homophobic slurs. I, I think that's horrible. Uh, it doesn't get worse, as far as I'm concerned. But Smollett's story appears to be in doubt after two brothers seen in security video were arrested, then released. Police say the information they gave has shifted the course of the investigation. Innocence prevailed, all right? My guys are walking home. They're not charged. They are not suspects in this case. Turns out the men are brothers who knew Smollett, one as a personal trainer and as an extra on Empire, Smollett's TV show. U.S. news outlets are quoting unnamed sources saying police are now investigating whether Smollett paid the men to attack him. You do such a disservice when you lie about things like this. Smollett's team denies he orchestrated the attack, and in an interview Thursday, the actor expressed frustration at his story being questioned. Listen, if I tell the truth, then that's it, because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Then it became a thing of like, oh... How can you doubt that? Like, how do you, how do you not believe that? It's the truth. But there's growing skepticism and anger. We believe Justice Smollett lied about being the victim of a hate crime and being assaulted. And for us, it's a slap in the face. Smollett says he feels victimized all over again by the latest doubts over his story. But if it was just a story and not the truth, he could face charges for lying to police. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. A group of would-be investors say fake experts on local radio stations conned them out of millions, saying the fraudsters posed as investment experts on shows that sounded like the news but were actually infomercials. GoPublic's investigation found those so-called experts had a history of duping investors in the U.S. before hitting the airwaves here in Canada. Here's Rosa Marcatelli. I'm still in awe, I'm just not going to lie. Tracy Conrad and her husband listened religiously for months before handing their savings over to what they thought were investment experts being interviewed on the radio. Shows that sounded like news, she says, with radio personalities who covered the news. Insightful, expert advice about money matters. This show is about investing in money, with money, and making money. The bombshell came from the provincial regulator, the Ontario Securities Commission, saying it suspects those so-called experts were using fake names and had a fake company. I trusted what I was hearing on the radio. Turns out they also weren't allowed to operate in Ontario. Conrad says one call by the radio stations to the regulator would have caught that. And I would have all my money still. She and her husband say they lost $15,000. Dozens of Ontario radio listeners say they lost even more for a total of $6 million, according to a class action lawsuit filed against the so-called experts and Chorus Entertainment. Chorus owns the global news radio shows that featured the fraudsters on programs like Ask the Experts and the Global Market. 
The allegations have not been proven in court. Chorus says the programs were infomercials and were clearly identified as such through disclaimers used before, after and during the program saying it intends to defend itself in court and is confident it acted diligently and responsibly, removing the programs after hearing concerns. Listener Cheryl Hansky says she lost $20,000 to the same fraudsters after listening to radio shows on stations owned by another media company, Bell Media. I never once uh, believed that it was an ad. Bell says its shows too were paid programs and when it became aware of legitimate concerns, it removed them. The Ontario Securities Commission believes the men who called themselves Stuart Price and Martin Schwartz on radio are actually Mark Singer and Bernard Sevilla. Go Public found Singer and Sevilla have a combined history of theft and investment fraud in the U.S., long before allegedly targeting Canadian investors. It seems the men have disappeared along with the money, not returning messages from Go Public or investors. In fact, the company's phone line has been disconnected and its website is down. It's horrible. Michael Ellis is the lawyer in the class action against Chorus and says he's preparing one against Bell. These media companies were putting people on the air that were not licensed, that had no ability to do what they said that they were going to do. This media ethicist says the situation is another example of the blurred line between news and advertising. The whole area of paid uh, paid content is is an ethical quagmire. Those who invested say the radio shows have gone silent on the topic. To this day they say nothing. Never explaining why the so-called experts are no longer on the air. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. If you have a tip for our Go Public team, they want to hear from you. Email them at gopublic at cbc.ca. Other developing stories we are watching tonight on The National. We awoke to a very loud bang and it was a, a violent um, shake of our house. A man is unaccounted for after an apparent explosion in Calgary early today. He was the tenant in a house that was leveled. Firefighters haven't been able to get inside because it's so unstable. Neighbors say the homeowner is away in Thailand. Several nearby homes were damaged. And a follow-up to the recent Amber Alert in Ontario. The man accused of killing his 11-year-old daughter, Rhea Rajkumar, is in hospital with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Police say the gunshot was not obvious and wasn't discovered for more than a day. Yesterday, officers noticed Rupesh Rajkumar was, quote, not acting right. So doctors found the wound and he was taken to a trauma centre. Still ahead tonight on The National, a fix for an aging population, what Canadian researchers are doing to create safe spaces for seniors. And a little later, meet the only Canadian on the Formula One circuit. Andrew sits down with Lance Stroll in our Sunday interview. But first, bracing for Brexit, how Europe's biggest port is preparing for the worst. The effects on the Dutch economy will be big. And that's why we say to our Dutch entrepreneurs, prepare yourself. Labour is red, Tories are blue, our future is bright, with a good deal in sight for the UK and our friends in the EU. The British House of Commons leader with a Brexit-themed poem of hope and optimism. But even that couldn't save Prime Minister Theresa May from suffering another embarrassing defeat in the Commons after MPs for the 11th time voted down her Brexit plans. This weekend, May launched a desperate appeal, pleading with lawmakers to unite behind her as she speaks with EU leaders this week. But the consequences of the impasse are already being felt. British regional airline Fly BMI ceased operations, partly blaming uncertainties surrounding Brexit. And aerospace giant Airbus says it's reconsidering future investments in Britain. It's absolutely catastrophic for us, and this is why we wanted to speak up. Many outside Britain are also speaking up. The economy in nearby Netherlands relies heavily on imports and exports. And as Thomas Degler found out, Brexit has the Dutch preparing for the worst. How do you like them onions? Red, yellow, take your pick. No one packs more onions than the Wiskirka plant in the southwest of the Netherlands. First bagged, then shipped 
around the world, though a whole 20% of the production goes straight to Britain. It's a fourth generation business and Cheyenne Wiskirka runs the place now. We pack approximately 185,000 metric tons of onions uh, a year. As it stands, British supermarkets can order a load of these Dutch onions one day and have them in store the next. But Britain's EU breakup could mean big kinks along the way. Are our trucks being stopped at a border? Do we need to have physical checks upon departure? We are not aware. And that's the most difficult thing. You, don't know how, you do not know how to pre prepare yourself. Yeah. Is, is there a risk that the supermarkets could run out? Yes, absolutely. When shipping abroad, plenty of Wiskirka's onions come through here. The port of Rotterdam, Europe's biggest, and a reminder of the giant role this city plays in international trade. It acts as a gateway to the mainland, and this Dutch lawmaker worries about Brexit Britain exporting economic trouble. It's a bit messy uh, on the other side, and that's a shame because uh, our economies are very much intertwined. Where some see a challenge, others look up and see opportunity like here at Rotterdam's own World Trade Center. In total, this whole building is 70,000 square meters. Jeroen Redder is eager to fill this office space. Yeah. Th this is actually, this is our top floor, our 23rd yeah. floor. It's under renovation with a view to attracting more foreign businesses, those keen to keep a foothold in the EU. To you, what does Brexit mean here? Uh, Brexit means the possibility to uh, uh, facilitate uh, uh, every customer I get and to explain them and help them. Part of the building withstood the Second World War. Rotterdam considers itself resilient. And with economic uncertainty like this, resiliency comes at a premium. The Dutch government says it's in talks with 250 foreign companies considering setting up shop here with Brexit looming. Some people are left wondering if this country has done a better job getting ready for Brexit than Britain has. Hello, I'm Brian McKenzie. That explains this meeting. If I can start with the acte, with the deed of the incorporation of the BV. Businessman Brian McKenzie has come to hand over his British passport to a Dutch notary, legally setting up a European subsidiary to his London-based tech firm. It's a way to reduce Brexit-related risk. Yeah, it feels like we're moving away from kind of where our roots are a bit, but that, yeah, but it's just, it's a necessity. I, I don't think there's a business in the UK that's not considering it. Britain has driven all of Europe to this junction, and the Netherlands is bracing for impact. The effects on the Dutch economy will be big. And that's why we say to our Dutch entrepreneurs, prepare yourself. The fear is Brexit could break down a well-oiled economy running this way for decades and costing eye-watering sums in the process. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Rotterdam, the Netherlands. That was a pretty good pun at the end. Still ahead on The National, our Sunday interview with Lance Stroll, how the young Canadian driver is hoping to steer his team to victory. And later, her colorful paintings depicted life in rural Nova Scotia. Now, decades later, Maude Lewis's home province is honoring her. I couldn't think of a better person to honor for Heritage Day. Um, you know, Maude is a, a true ambassador uh, to the province. Uh, her work does speak to the culture here. Battling heavy traffic on a Formula One racetrack at 300 kilometers per hour, well, that takes a special kind of nerve and skill. And right now, Montreal's Lance Stroll is the only Canadian competing at that elite level. F1 is notoriously unforgiving and mistakes can be deadly, but the prospect of winning is addictive. Our Andrew Chang recently spoke with Stroll about the thrill and pressure of being the only Canadian on the track. Formula One racing is a high-stakes, high-dollar sport. It happens mostly on European tracks, mostly with European drivers. Enter Lance Stroll. He's from Montreal, the only Canadian on the F1 circuit. He just turned 20 a few months ago, and his career has had a promising start. 
In his rookie season, he became just the third Canadian ever to finish on a podium, following in the footsteps of legendary Canadian racers Gilles Villeneuve and his son Jacques. But keeping up that pace isn't so easy. Last season, his Williams team finished at the bottom. And now there are big changes ahead. New car, new team, bigger expectations. The Sport Pacer, Racing Point, Formula One team livery for 2019. Lance Stroll is now part of the brand new team, the first to be unveiled in Canada and with a main Canadian investor. And he gets a hug from dad. His dad, billionaire fashion mogul Lawrence Stroll. We caught up with Lance at the Canadian International Auto Show. Lance, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How you been? I've been great. Yeah, glad to be here. New team, new car. Uh, new you've been, you knew everything. You've been racing your whole life, but this must feel different. It does. It does. It's um, it's a new chapter, and uh, it's it's extremely exciting. And I think everyone's excited. So um, all this this amp, all this uh, you know, all this energy in the building today, just you know, just gives me that itch to get, get behind the wheel and start driving the car. And to launch in Canada, I mean, that's, that's never been done. Oh, no, it's, it's, been, it's been great with, uh, with all the, the Canadian sponsors on the car. Um, you know, myself being Canadian, it's, uh, it's really, been, uh, really been incredible to, to do it here at home. What did you think when you saw the car? The pink's grown on me. The pink's grown on me, I must <laughs> did say. Did it take a while yeah, for the Yeah, at the beginning I was like, yeah. damn, I gotta drive the pink car, you know? <laughs> but then I'd be getting all this good feedback on it. Like, all my friends that don't know much about Formula One, they mentioned this pink car, and like, oh, I kind of like the pink car. And I'm like, no, that's actually not that bad. Actually, I, I like the pink now. So, um, yeah, it's great. It's definitely gonna stand out on track. And uh, more importantly, uh, I'm pretty sure with, uh, with the group of people we got behind it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a good car. You know, not to overstate the the weight on your shoulders, but I mean, it had been more than 10 years since Canada even fielded a competitor before you came mm -hmm. along in the F1. I mean, do, do, do you feel that that pressure behind the wheel? No, I feel I take it as a, like a kind of like a positive. Um, it's a good vibe in a way. I mean, uh, I don't I don't take it as pressure. If anything, I. I, I strive off of it, I feel off of it. And, and, and just as I travel the world as well, you know, you see a Canadian flag here, a Canadian flag there. It's, um, it's great, it's great energy. That's ultimately what, what, you know, what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's, uh, you know, it's an honor to, to, to represent the Leaf. Talk to me about growing up. Who got you into racing? Who got you interested? Well, I guess I'd have to say I got the bug from my dad. Um, you know, he's always been passionate about it. He did a bit of racing back in the day himself it was you know for, for, as a hobby and Montreal's and, uh, a good city to grow up in and Montreal is a great city to grow up in I mean I'd go to the Grand Prix every year and you know I'd see the cars and you have memories of, of watching I do, the Grand Prix I do Montreal? yeah I'd like you know just little kind of um, uh, flashbacks uh, remember Michael Schumacher won the Grand Prix a few times but yeah I just uh, woke up every Sunday morning was like a thing turn on the TV at breakfast because you know most of the race in Europe so you, you know, get the, the race at 8 a.m. kind of thing and um, yeah, I just got the bug for it. And it's going to be Michael wow. Schumacher winning in Canada. And then I started go karting, and it kind of just took off from there. Yeah, because I mean, watching is one thing, but but what your dad encouraged you to to really get into racing? Yeah, he didn't really encourage me. Uh, I kind of took it on myself. I did a bit of karting on the weekends, and um, he didn't, you know, really think much of it. I kind of just rented my kart and I went there on the weekends, and then I started racing, and then he started to come watch me racing, and then it. Just then, then it just became, you know, took over the hockey game. So, <laughs> yeah. and the whole time, I mean, you don't think your dad kind of secretly hoped, wished that you would? Oh, for sure. I mean, we've been we've been on this journey together, and it's been a, like a dream team in a way. You know, we've uh, we've always envisioned Formula One down the road, but it was such a long shot back then. And uh, and now I'm sitting here today, and I'm working alongside him. It's an extremely uh, special, uh, you know, opportunity, and I'm thankful and grateful every day for, um, you know, for, for, for the support he's given me along the way. Lance As Lance says, it's been quite a journey, one filled with achievement. He made a name for himself by succeeding. He wins the race! Every step of the way, winning multiple championships in Formula 4 and Formula 3. Canada has produced another great champion. It set the stage for his F1 debut in 2017 at the age of just 18. No easy feat. 
I think to your rookie season, mm -hmm. Azerbaijan, 2017. Yeah, 2017. That Take was a special that. day. Oh, it was. Um, wow, it was. Uh, it was the, the highlight of my career. Highlight of my career. I mean, standing on a Formula One podium, my rookie season at 18 years old. It was like beyond imagination. And that was a wild I, race. It, too. Yeah, it was. It was a crazy race. I remember start, I started eighth, and I gained a few positions, and then. Suddenly, people just started dropping out of the race, and then there was well, so many safety car restarts. I overtook a couple of people, and then next thing you know, I was in second place. And I first placed, you know, three seconds up the road, and I had two world champions chasing me down, and in, a, in, in quicker cars, and I had to kind of maintain my pace, or else I wouldn't have finished on the podium. So, just a, a dream come true, and um, it'll be in the history books forever. You, you have to tell me about the celebration on the podium, though. Explain no, that I really me. rather Explain, not. No, no, no. I want to know about this because <laughs> um, for those who don't know, you mean the drinking from the shoe? The, the thing? drinking I from the shoe. I know what you're saying. Yeah, you can just spit it out. It's cool. <laughs> so the shoey. Um, so the explain, shoey. explain what that was. Well, apparently it's some kind of Australian tradition, and Daniel Ricciardo won the race, um, and he tends to kind of just take his shoe off and you know pour some champagne in there, and um, it's like a little ritual thing he's got going. So. I was, I was, I was you, yeah, I was yeah, like the newbie you, at the time, so right. <laughs> I guess it was uh, my bottoms well up. Great sport. Valtteri, are you partaking? Oh, there's like some dirt in there as well. <laughs> I couldn't back out of it. Every, you know, there's thousands of people watching. Never, Especially never do it again. Yeah. But your, your dad was there, too. My dad was and there, too. And he must have been yeah. just really proud. For sure, for sure. It was just a very emotional day for, for the Stroll family. And so the, the thing that was really special is I had a lot of close people around me that weekend, and I was able to celebrate, celebrate it with them, which is priceless. You know? So now we're at the point where, you know, your dad decides, hey, I want to buy a team and, and the team that you ultimately would drive for. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, was it always clear to you that, that you would drive for the team? Uh, yes, uh, we, we did, you know, we, we talked about it and uh, discussed it um, on a regular basis, but it was definitely the right move for, for my career. And uh, I see, my, you know, I, 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 I can share my father's vision. Lance says he embraces that father-son racing partnership, but his critics have been tough. He's been branded by some as a pay driver, someone whose most important contribution to a team is money, not skill. It's an insult, one he disputes fiercely. But some would say it's also just part of a sport where top teams routinely spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Privilege and Formula One do go hand in hand, but for Stroll, ultimately, to hell with the critics. Do you feel in some ways that you have to almost push away a little bit, that you have to dissociate yourself from your dad to kind of tell people, no, I, mm. I earned my spot? Mm, well, I do my talking on the track, so that's kind of how I've always looked at it. And, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of criticism. Um, from the outside that I fuel off of because I, I, I try and look at everything with a smile on my face and um, you know and I've always looked at that as like background noise kind of thing but my dad's helped me so much along the way just with support and I know that I'm, I'm very fortunate to be to be in the position that I'm in but I've grabbed it with both hands so you know, I just I just try and do do me out there on the track and uh, you know and I, and I look at the, the opportunity of my father as, um, as, as a positive thing and not a negative so I embrace it. So the race you're most looking forward to? Montreal. 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 I have to have to say Montreal. It's uh, it's one of a kind. It's one of a kind for sure. What would it mean to to do really well at that race for you? It would be extra extra special. I guess is the best way of putting it. At home, um, but yeah, happy to do well anywhere really. To be honest, but uh, a good result at home would be like a, a cherry on top. I guess. I was enamored with his outfit there. Anyway, still ahead on the National, we introduce you to a different kind of emergency response team, and it's fixed to help seniors who have fallen. But first, here's a look at an interview we'll bring you tomorrow night on the National. Hey, I know that guy. Susan Ormiston met up with Sting. How'd she get that assignment to talk about his musical and why he thinks Canadians can relate? I am feeling that Ontario will uh, respond to this play. Why? I think the themes of the play are resonant, you know, where people are losing their jobs. I know it's happening here. GM, GM. in Oshawa. So the themes of the play are, you know, very topical. Ship will be ready to sail. 
Sting's musical is forged from his upbringing in a shipbuilding town in England. It's about the dignity of work and what happens when that work disappears. Hundreds, thousands of people lost their jobs, lost their homes, and uh, it's been it's been tough. Here are some of the other stories we're following this week on the National. A pro pipeline convoy from Alberta is set to roll onto Parliament Hill on Tuesday to deliver a message to Ottawa. Among other concerns, the truckers want the Trudeau government to do more to support the oil and gas sector. The city here plans to close the roads around Parliament Hill both days to make way for all those trucks. We, we have to include an invitation for Ms. Wilson-Raybould to speak. I, 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 it, it baffles me that that isn't the most obvious thing in this entire conversation. Also on Tuesday, the House of Commons returns and with it the House Justice Committee, which will meet to discuss other possible witnesses in its probe of the SNC-Lavalin controversy. Last week, the Liberal majority in that committee voted down calls to have some key players testify, including the one person everyone wants to hear from, Jody Wilson-Braybould, and some senior members of the Prime Minister's office. The opposition parties say that they will try again this week. Le conferenze episcopali. Pope Francis today asked the faithful gathered in St. Peter's Square to pray for the success of a highly anticipated summit on child abuse. This week's meeting at the Vatican will bring together senior bishops from around the world as the Catholic Church continues to struggle with a decades-long sexual abuse crisis. Francis has called this an urgent challenge for the Church. For older Canadians, one false step can mean the difference between mobility and disability. A sudden fall can have a devastating impact on quality of life. But hospitals and universities are looking for new ways to keep seniors safe. As Cass Rusi shows us in The Fix, one Ontario pilot program brings help directly to their homes. Niagara 2363. We're on the road in Ontario's Niagara region with a unique emergency response team. A team with a singular focus, responding only to emergency calls from seniors who've fallen. It had possible nose fracture. Now when paramedic Eric Huffman is dispatched, Leslie Yole, an occupational therapist, is right by his side. Sometimes we are a first response. If a call was to come in and the person states when they called, I have no injuries. I just want help up. I've fallen. How many times does that happen? It does a lot. Hoffman and Yole arrive at the home of an 81-year-old woman in Welland. So we're a new program. She lives alone and doesn't want to go to the hospital. This isn't her first fall. Hoffman checks the woman's medication because some prescribed drugs can contribute to the risk of falls. Your foot sore? Yoel finds out that the senior fell from her walker while reaching for a cell phone. A quick check of the apparatus and she spots the problem. Even when this brake was on, the wheels move in here. That's not good. A simple repair job does the trick. You know what, if I can prevent the next fall, that's why I'm here. If I can keep her safe, she wants to be in her home. She's a, quite an independent lady. Falls are the leading cause of injury for seniors, responsible for 32% of all reported emergency department visits in 2017. A financial burden on health care, costing more than $2 billion. These images of real-life falls are from long-term care facilities in the Vancouver area. They're difficult to watch, but provide valuable clues for researchers at Simon Fraser University in how and why falls occur in older adults. We specifically focus on what are the, the two most important injuries related to falls, hip fracture and traumatic brain injury. One of the experiments his researchers conduct involves a giant moving platform nicknamed the Slipatron that's able to move in different directions and at different speeds. Ready? A fall is induced. Again. And again. And again. Interesting how you're completely knees there, no hands. Yeah. 
Sensors on the volunteer's body measure the fall, and infrared cameras record it all in 3D, allowing researchers to further study things like the speed, direction, and impact of the fall. Some older adults who have sensory impairment or are on certain medications, they're constantly in a state of trying to maintain their balance, having to recover their balance. But while researchers like Rabinovich concentrate on the science of falls, it's almost impossible to measure the emotional toll it can take. Erin Harris was fit and active all of her life until a tumble down a flight of stairs changed that. I was walking five miles a day, forever, and it went down to one street. It took her several weeks to recover from a broken ankle, but it took her years before she felt safe enough to reclaim her old life. Now she's determined not to have it happen again. I decided to train like an athlete again, and that meant anything and everything that was offered to me. She enrolled in a falls prevention program at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. It just allowed me to focus on my balance, my flexibility, my adaptability to change, and I was very grateful for that. As seniors like Erin work to fight their fear of falling. And this is our general purpose lab. Where these accidents happen is also being studied. The main culprit? The bathroom, with all of its hard and slippery surfaces. More than 70% of falls happen getting in and out of the tub. This bathing disability is a huge issue, and it's one of the primary reasons that an older adult will have to leave their home. So if we really do want to support this idea of aging in place, the bathroom is one of the areas we have to address. Alison Novak and a team of researchers at Toronto Rehab have been working on making bathrooms safer. And in their latest research, the focus is on grab bars. Should it be present? Should it be mandatory? How many falls will it prevent? And then if it should be mandatory, where should it be placed? How long should it be? This simulated bathroom is held up by hydraulic lifts in a hangar that looks straight out of Nassau. 73-year-old Gary Evans is the recruit. Oh, a bit of unsteadiness there. Right. By slipping, researchers can study how quickly the volunteer is able to recover and hold on to the grab bar. Hi, Anna. Back in Niagara, Leslie Yole and Eric Huffman are still on the road. They've dropped in on a senior they've met before. Try and get onto your hands and knees. She's known as a frequent faller. Whenever you're ready, we'll try to get up towards the couch. Yol wants to see how she's doing and give her some pointers on how to get up from a spill. It's still early, but officials say the falls team is already making a difference. Hard work, yay. There's been fewer visits to the emergency rooms. And while the program doesn't promise to prevent the first fall, its goal is to make sure there are no further ones. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Niagara. Very interesting. The moment is coming up next, but first. In case you missed it, they say there's a fine line between courage and stupidity. After all, it's not every Canadian who'd do a 15 kilometer triathlon when it's 20 below. But these Winnipeggers did in the first Beat the Cold race along the River Trails path at the Forks, raising money for a program called Just a Warm Sleep, which runs a much needed Winnipeg overnight warming shelter for the homeless. This is my lucky day. I came in and on the ground I found $20 on the floor, so more money for the uh, charity. 200 people turned out to run five clicks, ride five clicks, and skate five clicks raising $10,000 in the process, money that will finance the shelter for a whole month. We still have to count all the dimes and stuff, but uh, it, we've done, people have been very generous. Which I think only proves that my home province of Manitoba tends to produce superhumans or maniacs or maybe both anyway. The point is not all heroes wear capes. Sometimes they wear four pounds of ice in their beards. Is it frozen? <laughs> yeah, I thought that was gonna happen.
She never painted for a gallery, never sought fame, just painted what she could see out her window. And in doing so, many say Maude Lewis captured the true beauty of Nova Scotia. Late in life and then after her death, Lewis was recognized across Canada and around the world. Now the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia even showcases her tiny painted house. Today, another honour. The province has chosen her to be this year's nominee for Heritage Day. What that means to those who celebrate her work is our moment. Maude is a true ambassador uh, to the province. Uh, her work does speak to the culture here and it does speak to uh, life in Nova Scotia. So I think she's the perfect selection for Heritage Day. Maud painted on what was ever available to her. Uh, a lot of her, her work is done on uh, wood shingles, um, but this is a, a, an example of something that she would have painted on, so this would have been a serving tray, um, something a little bit more non-traditional. So this is the, the famous Maud Lewis painted house, and it is, is here permanently in the gallery. So this is the house that she shared with uh, her husband Everett, and it is considered her greatest canvas. And we actually built the gallery around the house itself. When, when you look at her works, um, it kind of conjures up emotions, um, so you can see, uh, you know, themes of joy throughout her work. Everyone in her, her paintings are, are happy and enjoying the experience that, that they're taking on, whether it's, you know, animals or, or people or, or the famous cats that she always paints. I, I couldn't think of a better person to honor for Heritage Day. Two lovely things about that. Uh, the Heritage Day honoree is chosen by school kids, so they were the ones who came up with Maude's name. And Maude, uh, if you've read anything about her, had a pretty difficult life. Uh, was quite poor, had arthritic hands, and in spite of that, managed to paint all of those beautiful, joyful paintings that fill that gallery. That's The National for this Sunday, February 17th. Good night, everyone.